everyone for joining us for this session. My name is Meg Zwick. I am a senior vice president with Millennium Trust Company based just outside of Chicago, Illinois. We are a qualified custodian and have been in the marketplace lending space for, uh, gosh, six years now, um, providing custody services and transparency to underlying investors. And uh, I've been asked to moderate this session, which is going to be discussing the rewiring of bank lending. I would like to thank this panel for joining me today, and I will let them go through and introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their, their play in the industry. We'll start with Alex. Hi, everyone. Alex Zook. I'm head of product at RDC. Uh, RDC's mission is to make sure that our financial network is, um, is free of those who may conspire to uh, do bad things with, with uh, the, their ability to launder money. Um, we are, um, we do this by having the world's largest financial risk relevant database and, and screening engine. Um, and we're happy to talk today about uh, the rewiring of, of bank lending from um, not only our, our, our partners here in FinTech in London, uh, but from a larger financial institution perspective and, and how they're looking at the same issue. My name is Christine Alva. I'm the CFO for Oak North Bank here in the UK and Acorn Globally, the platform distribution uh, of the same uh, lending for SMEs uh, globally to other institutions not in the UK. Um, so our uh, target is to unlock the SME, complex SME lending uh, in a way that it uh, uh, offers a flexible and customized uh, solution for the SMEs in a way that it's uh, efficient uh, through all the automation, digital, and uh, process optimization, and uh, more than anything, a data lake that we are building to optimize decisions. Happy FinTech fortnight, everybody. Thank you for sticking through with us here today. My name is Sam Tausig. I'm head of global policy, uh, privacy as well for Cabbage, and also sit on the international strategy team. Uh, Cabbage is a US direct FinTech lender in the United States. Um, SMB loans up to $250,000. We've rolled our automation technology, the artificially intelligent algorithms into a software as a service for large global banks, uh, the likes of ING, Santander, Scotiabank. And uh, I believe today we're gonna talk a little about how those all integrate. Hi, I'm Richard Curtin. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Esme Loans Limited, which is a new uh, digital lending platform uh, that's set up uh, by World Bank of Scotland. Um, we set up about a year ago and we provide unsecured finance into the uh, SME sector, so sort of loans 5,000 up to 150,000 uh, pounds. We did that by partnering with, uh, with another fintech business called um, EasyBob, which provided a sort of similar type of service and uh, digital format to Cabbage, actually. All right, let's get started. Um, let's just start with why are challenger banks and platforms a better place to address today's customers? Um, Christina, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. So, um, as we were discussing outside before we were coming in, so traditional banks have been there for decades, uh, some of them centuries, so they know, they knew the traditional banking the way it was uh, going. However, with increasing regulation and uh, Global banks have a lot of infrastructure costs, so being able to reduce that cost to income ratio, we're saying between 40 and 50% to the 20, 25% that fintechs have, the digital companies are in a better position to tackle those markets and, and those needs from in an efficient way. So what we believe at Oak North is that by optimizing on the back end for the SME clients we've got, that it's after SME and Cabbage have been able to serve them with the loans from half a million pounds to 25, uh, half a million, to 25 million pounds. Uh, the end customer still wants to have that face-to-face -face, uh, interaction, have a relationship manager, but then how do we attack the cost problem for not having a uh, all so many people uh, tackling one underwriting, we do it by highly automated processes and a lot of digitized uh, systems. So that is what it's allowing us, in our case, to tackle that market in a profitable way. We've already reported benefits. So, 
So your example, I think, is important to look at. Um, if we stop for a second and look at the premise of the question and look historically, we're talking about fintechs, platforms, and banks. And if we were back up 10 years ago or five years ago, you had a lot of arrogance on both sides. You had banks saying, eh, these fintech companies, whatever, they're risky, they're dangerous, they have no idea what they're doing. And you had fintech companies saying, you know, screw you big banks, we're gonna take you over completely. And what we've seen is really an inversion of, of the word fintech to tech fin, emphasis on the technology. Uh, there's a couple of people today who have talked about this. Uh, and to your point, banks have a, a couple of good things. They have um, customers, they have sticky and, and inelastic customers, they have deposits, the capital, but they also have a lot of technology, which is actually quite good, and they have a lot of data, which is absolutely invaluable. Fintechs have the operational efficiency to target that data in a super sleek and, for the user experience, sexy way, make sense of it, ingest it, and go through a, uh, an underwriting process separate from the bank, but governed by their third-party risk management guidelines to actually deliver an underwriting outcome, a pricing, a line assignment, in Cabbage's case, and then potentially service it as, as add-on features later on. So Richard, maybe this is a good place for you to jump in here and talk about how banks are choosing to adopt the new, newly coin term tech fin strategy. <laughs> you have to put a copyright on that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's, it's interesting times at the moment. So the, the big banks have spent probably the best part of the last 10 years having to deal with lots of um, issues um, that they've, they've struggled to deal with and also um, have been built on, on very sort of 1960s sort of legacy computer systems, which at the same time as the regulatory issues they've been dealing with, they've been looking at that, uh, that side of things as well which has presented the opportunity in the market for the fintechs and the challenger banks to come along and redesign processes in a far more slick uh, perspective for the customer, the end user, um, and, uh, and also from themselves from an operational perspective. The interesting dynamic um, between the two is that the challenger banks have the slick operational infrastructure and processes which the customers like, um, but they don't have the trust factor that the big banks have that the customers like. And nor do they have the same origination power that the, uh, and ability to acquire clients in the same way as the big banks do. Which I think is why you start to see a lot more collaboration between um, big banks and fintechs, um, both of them trying to access the same sort of uh, space in terms of the banks trying to access the slickness and operational efficiencies that the challenges have. At the same time, uh, the fintechs seeking new ways to acquire customers or utilize the expertise that they've developed over time by sending it up into the banks to, to benefit from. So uh, going along those same lines in terms of customer acquisition, um, Alex, maybe you can jump in on this one. What is your thoughts on the difference between the two models, between the traditional lenders and FinTech? So I think we've covered a couple points that are, yep. that are relevant, right? Mm -hmm. One would be the traditional model of the bank acquiring a customer, uh, which they, they do have the most customers, but the, the cost of that acquisition is should be thought of as around um, you know, a thousand U.S. dollars or, or, or even higher. But once that customer is in that ecosystem, that's what the banks are worrying about, right? They're trying to keep a sticky relationship, um, selling different products to that consumer. Uh, while that may be substantially lower for, for the fintechs, it, it's all about that timing element. The challenge that fintechs will always address, and, and, and timing is key. Ease of accessibility would be key. Um, interesting concept because that will then requires scale and a search for a customer base at, at, at mass that allows fintechs to grow and, and be profitable. Um, and, and that will present different challenges, right? Because every jurisdiction becomes a unique value proposition um, and, and looking for that guidance as to how they move into those markets and address those additional customers will be a, a, a remaining question for, for many of the fintechs who are looking to expand new customer sets. Um, and, and that means geographic expansion usually, right? So one of the um, things that Sam or Desai said this morning is that Funding Circle's um, focus this year is to change the bank first mentality. And we talked a little bit about this prior to this session and what that really means for the industry next in terms of banking and fintech and how they're gonna play together. So there was a, a lot of interesting conversation about this and Alex, do you wanna um, continue to go with this, and I know the rest of the panel has an opinion on this as well. So I think that topic is, is largely right, but I think we should take, a, when you take a global view, you see that 
that's already be disrupted in certain markets, right? Um, I, I would argue that um, let, let's call it in a let's call it an Asia Pacific market for now, but like, it, those are all these unique countries. Um, th they've really bypassed a lot of that infrastructure, right? And they're they're looking more to mobile payments and and are and are comfortable with that. So I think that's a sliding scale. I think um, you know we we may look at customer sets within, whether it's within Europe or the UK and the United States and, and have that same mentality. Um, but the customer segmentation is, is very surprising uh, as to who needs what. And, and I think there is conventional wisdom that would say um, younger, younger people who are entering, who are, who are, who are looking for savings accounts, um, may, uh, who are looking for home loan mortgages, uh, may be more apt to use um, more of the, the fintech um, uh, type of applications. And, and, and as these use cases and models are progressing, I think that data is becoming very uh, informative as to how to segment those customers. And that may not always be the case. So I think we need to be, we need to be careful about you know, the type of relationships that are being formed at the bank. And as that data assets and those data troves about customers are made available, we'll learn a lot more about the behaviors um, uh, uh, and those interactions between uh, a consumer and, and their financial services provider. So it's, it, it, I think it is pretty complicated. It's hard to have a conventional wisdom across the board. So I agree with you on, on the front end is very important, thinking about new customers. You know, Amazon really gets to the core of like your neural pathway response. It's like, hey, I had a great experience. I'm gonna keep using you for other shit. Let's go. Um, that's super important, but banks, if you look at where they're going to go in the future, as particularly in this open banking world we have here in the UK and, and in, in Europe, um, as we strip away some of their core services, they're just going to come down to a pile of customers and the ability to hold deposits. If you're a bank board, um, most of which you know those guys have grown up, and I say guys intentionally, have grown up in the bank or in another bank or a very closely related institution, they're looking at this and saying, oh, crap, like what are we gonna do? That's where I think the partnership is particularly um, important to bring in the ability to farm out other services. They already do it today. If you look at AML KYC, they tried that, but they do other important things in the core service function. Um, farming out lending to partnerships is very much the same path. And I would expect to see banks intersect with a larger ecosystem of technology platforms um, data companies, et cetera, to basically offer a holistic customer experience. Um, look, people don't necessarily use banks like they would use Instagram. The, the rewards pathway is not there. But if you think about, hey, can I integrate this into one interface where it's super simple because I just want a small business loan, I don't really care about where it's coming from per se, as long as it's easy and it's cheap, um, you've democratized the access to banking into a larger tech environment. So I wanted to add to that, that what we are seeing as we are starting to partner with other uh, countries, there's the incumbent banks in other countries, in Europe or in the US, they say, I'm already market leader in the region where I am, but to your point, um, I'd like to offer these other product segments or type of product to SMEs in the case we're doing in a more efficient way, more faster, more flexible, and I'm not able to do it. So if we go there with a data platform, with a fleet process, they say, I'm happy to do it. Uh, use white label, we don't care where it's coming from. I have the core AML processes, I've got all my risk processes, but if you help me doing this much faster and in a way that the client is gonna be happier, I want to keep that client retention because it cost initially cost me a lot of money to acquire the customer. So it's customer acquisition with data information, data lakes, behavior learning, it's all together, but the bigger banks, what we are learning now that we are trying to partner with them, say we just don't have anyone that focuses on this particular problem that we've got in this niche, market niche or in this product. So that's where uh, we are seeing that there is a possibility, a very active possibility of partnership very relevant at the moment. Yeah, I think there's definitely areas where it's natural for banks to partner with fintechs to, to learn from their technical capabilities or their operational efficiencies in very specific areas. Um, it'd be interesting to see how, how that evolves into more of the more mainstream type products over time, but because the banks are rapidly reinventing themselves and, and catching up quick in, in, in the core markets. Okay, um, changing a little bit of the subject, but um, recently the U.S. Senate 
took the first step in approving a deregula or deregulation of the Dodd-Frank Act within the U.S., which was going is intended to offer relief to smaller banks to loosen up lending. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on that and what that means for this industry, which really was built on filling a void that banks left based on regulation. So, um, yeah, Sam, let's start with you. Uh, do you think that this is going to... You know, I think, what did I say? Uh, be careful what you wish for, right? So now, is the, are states going to be jumping in and regulating? Uh, and very, very much so, I think. So um, whenever I get depressed in the swamp of Washington, D.C., I love coming over to Europe and the U.K. Um, you guys have fintech weeks. We're fighting to stay alive in some business models. I'm just happy that I don't work in cryptocurrency right now. Um, but what we've seen in the Senate is uh, 2155 basically stripped some of the Dodd-Frank provisions for our um, 5,000 some odd community banks. And for the most part, that's great. It got a lot of Democratic support. It's seeing some absolutely insane inter-party politics play out in the U.S. House, um, which frankly are baffling to most bank lobbyists that have been working on this for the last eight years. But um, whether or not it passes, you already are seeing states be and other um, agency regulators begin to fill the void, um, including attorneys general. The, the issue is very similar to what happened in 2000. Um, when President Bush took office, you had a backlash of um, state consumer protection regulators say, okay, DC is not going to do anything for a while, we need to clamp down. Um, the California AG, the Massachusetts AG, the New York AG are all very closely watching fintech, and you will see state regulators try to um, insert themselves into bank partnership models that are traditionally within the, the governance of the FDIC or the OCC, and really clamp down on privacy and uh, access to data as we kind of slip away from the memory of 2008 here and in the United States. We're going to look at the data architecture as the next big thing. Okay, well, I see we have uh, quite a few questions up here, so let's jump to that. So, let's see. Loads of talk on process innovation. What about financial product innovation? Anyone out there working on product innovation as opposed to just tech? Anyone want to jump on that one? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely looking at product innovation as much as tech innovation. Uh, and tech's an enabler and allows you to then innovate the products off the back of it. So. You get the systems and operational efficiencies in place first, and then you build the, the product around it. So, uh, that's a well, the way we're seeing, we talk to the customer first, as I said. We do all the tech on the back end, so the client, from a lending point of view, does not perceive it's a digital bank for them. It's just a relationship manager that talks to, or a lending director that talks to them. And what we do is to customize the product to what the client needs. So, it's we create a new product with every new client. So okay. there's new legals, there's new product features, there's new amortization schedule, anything the client needs, we adapt. With cash flow lending, with collateral, we collateralize on assets, on art, on houses they got, or if, if they want to offer collateral, or otherwise it's the security of the um, cash flow lending, right? So from a lending point of view, we create a new product for every new customer need. And on the deposit side, we also are looking at whatever is there. We're trying to, we launch a lottery bond. It didn't work, but we keep trying. We is like passwords. We try new things. We're testing ongoing on the market. I've got a team of product people on the deposit side that are testing. Every second we were testing something. Some don't work, some do work. So we just uh, very much into the innovation side of the product. Yeah, I guess the view is, uh, the vision is, your platform, your fintech company or your bank should know what you want, what you need, and how you want it delivered before you even know that. Um, very similar to, you know, the classic Netflix model. They know I like really trashy action movies on the weekends, and they serve that up. Um, if I'm a small business, they know that I want an invoice financing product, and I also want a new way to accept credit cards online. Um, because I can see that in the underlying data and make that recommendation maybe even before I intuit that as the owner. Did you have anything to add, Alex? Or <laughs> Look, um, I've, as head of product at, at RDC, I mean, we're, the, the product that we're offering is, is based on data trails and based on data outcomes, right? So as we're, as we're looking at the results of, 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 of screening trillions of customer transactions, we're, 
we've we've learned from those right over the course of the years. And and what we'd like to do is release a, a, a disruption of the model that says I need to go through nine, ten steps of AML in order to get to the end result where we think we can offer the score through our through our algorithms that says this is the result before you know it. So you know, I, I think that there has been, we've, we've talked about process, we've talked about data, those are enabling transformative product uh, at speed and at scale that we've never seen before, right? And that's what's disrupting and rewiring this banking community right now. I think this is a quick one. Christina, does Oak North operate a branch network? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think this would, the, this is always a, a hot topic, but customer data is key. Are you ready for GDPR to uphold the trust of your customers? Um, well, I think we, we are GDPR ready, right? We have to be. I think in, you have to be, May, right? So we are. We are. We've taken all the steps to make sure that we are. Uh, do we like, do we think is the best way to be GDPR ready? Probably not. And because it's a new regulation where all the standards are not really out there and we don't have anywhere to benchmark with because it's so new, where this is going to be now an evolving process until we fully adopt it and we feel all comfortable that this is the best balance for GDPR compliance. We are go all going to be compliance day one, but I've seen people say, oh, GDPR, you cannot keep the business cards of this person. I say, just give me a break. I mean, this person has given me the professional contact. It's not his home address with their right. um, uh, passport number. So uh, there's, there's going to be, uh, someone is going to go on steroids to comply with it. Some others are going to be not so much. And then it will bounce back until it finds a, a, a happy medium. But the happy medium has to be also helped by, by the policy enforcers, enforcers right? Wh what is that happy medium? Mm -hmm. I agree with you. It just uh, I feel that at times there's just a complete overstepping uh, you know, and overinterpretation. Um, Richard, does doesn't Esme have more risk appetite slash broader risk parameters for NatWest slash RBS? Yes, we uh, Esme has more uh, a broader risk appetite than uh, than the core bank does. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Any other any other thoughts for our pan from our panel? All right, well, thank you all for joining us today.